and take up for satsang this evening. It's a beautiful bhajan by Santijaya Singh in which she talks about Coming mad in the love of God. Your love has made me mad. Now I, I have no control over it. Ramakrishna used to say, mad that's the word you have to become mad in the love of God if you want to realize it so all the great masters have been great lovers of God that's how you get to this divine realization just through this very intense love So how do we realize God? By developing this very intense love for Him. So that's the way. That's the only way. And when one has the good luck of falling madly in love with God, then he's already realized. Realization is this, having this very intense love for God. Obviously, to have this intense love for God, you have to be in touch with Him. You have to experience what God is. As far as it becomes an unknown factor for us, we can't love it. We begin to love him as, as we manifest him within ourselves. 
as we tune in with this divine presence and there is no better way for this than uh, tuning in to God through a living master because God is an abstract idea there are so many concepts about what God is or how God is there are so many theologies that talk about this divine reality how it is but knowing intellectually is not knowing experientially so you can read books about God is divine reality how it is so many explanations there are libraries full of these from all possible religions and they all talk about their experience about God how they had this experience how it came to them if you read them you will find that they are similar mm -hmm. but there is no one the same as the other one they all have some peculiarities of their own so we have to have our own experience in order to know how it is for us how it's going to be for us Reading, reading these books you get enthusiasm, encouragement, longing to have this experience but then we have to make our own journey we make we have to make this experience our own so this absolute God unless it becomes something concrete for us a uh, substantial experience in our life we can't really love such a God we may imagine that we love such a God but we don't really we begin to love God as we experience God and more, the more intense it becomes our experience the more love we develop for him and for most of us human beings it is impossible to tune in with God unless we find a human being a human pole that incarnates in our time this presence this energy this love this power so the human pole is a fundamental need for spiritual realization and we can never develop this intense love unless we direct it to somebody that's like us because we are human beings and we can't love a cow or a, um, whatever a monkey an elephant in India they love everybody <laughs> cats <laughs> monkeys, elephants 
they're very good. But for most of us human beings, uh, we need a human being. We need somebody that talks our language, that has eyes as we have to convey to us something, transmit to us something. And it's a very good luck if we meet somebody that becomes really the, the, the bridge, the powerhouse through which we connect with the general electricity. So if we analyze our life, if we are seekers of truth and we analyze our life, honestly we will have to admit that any spiritual leap in our life it has been always when we spend time with the Master. Those have been always the turning points, the most important points, the most intense ones. At least that's how it has been for me. If I had never met Master Kirpal, I would be nobody. I would have known nothing. I would have just been a lost being. But the meeting with Master Kirpal really saved my life. Why? Because it was like you are crossing the desert and finally you find the lake or you find the sea and just swim into it. can drink it. You can be drenched with it. So I had my ideas before I met Master but about what God is. Or better I would say I had more ideas about what God is not. It was very difficult for me to believe in something. It has always been very difficult for me to believe in something. Now, because I am so devoted to Master Pal and to Sanji, you may think that I was an easy believer. But it was not like this. I've never been an a easy believer, and I'm not an easy believer. To convince myself about something, it has to become really like a slap in my face. Very real something. Otherwise I don't believe anything. But when you hit a mountain, <laughs> then it becomes very real. And that's how it was for me meeting Master Kipar, really, really meeting a mountain. Mountain of energy of divine power, divine light. So when you bang your head against something like that, you can say, uh, it's not real, it didn't happen. You can't act anymore like it didn't happen. Otherwise, you're not real anymore. And then, from then on, all the best, times of my life, all the most intense, divine moments of my life, they've always been in the meetings with my masters, either as Master Kirpal or as Sanjay. And how was this? <coughs> in which way it happened? I mean, what happened in these meetings? It was like always, like 
meeting this ocean of light, this ocean of love. And all those retreats I had, especially with Sanji, those many retreats, it was always like swimming in light, in light and in love. Because light and love are just the same thing. Where there is light, there is love, and where there is love, there is light. So I experienced so much of this intensity, this, this divine presence, this divine love. And by and by this goes very deep into yourself and transforms you in a very deep way, at a cell level. That's what means the transformation of man from human into divine. All your being becomes sucked in this divine love, this divine light, this divine presence. So then becomes also divine wisdom, knowledge. which is not an academic knowledge. It's a knowing because of clear vision, because of direct perception and identification with reality. And this is what we try to do in these hour retreats. We try to, to develop, to grow this field of light and love. That's why we come together, to make it intense ever more. Until we really become like mad in the love of God. And then we are very ecstatic, very blissful, very happy. Happy for no reason. Just because you are saturated with this, this beauty. We always want a reason, an object, something that comes from outside in order to be happy. But the real happiness is the happiness that comes from directly from your divine perception, your inner perception, from nothing from outside. That's the real world. When you don't need anything, then you are just Aesthetic, blissful. But we are given gifts, we are given grace. we really appreciate this. We have to be honest with what we are given. We have to be grateful and do our own part. Because if we spend everything to be given to us for free, that is not fair. Then we are not honest. God awakens us to this divine presence then we have to do our best to keep it alive, to make it grow, to make it more intense. And this is what we do through our spiritual practice. By 
by attending satsang, by doing our med daily meditation, by doing our simran during the day, trying to be tuned in as much as possible. This will keep us alive in a good way. Otherwise we are alive anyway, but in a bad way, in an unworthy way. We can have a life which is worthy, worth living, and we can have a life which is not worthy living. So we have to choose what kind of life we want to have. I know we all have our limits. We all have our potential. But we should not be limited by our limits. We should try to broaden them, to make, to break them, and make them wider. To break our limits. That's, that's the aim of a spiritual practice, of a spiritual life. Molana Rumi says, make your last better than your first means don't come to the end time of your life by being as you were in the beginning. Try to come at the end time of your life being a better being that has broken limits. Otherwise we live for nothing. If we leave this world just as we were when we came in, then it was useless living. We have to make this life successful and we make it successful by coming at the end of this life not being the same or even worse than what we were when we came in this life. We make it successful if we come to the end being better. more conscious, more aware, more focused, more in control of ourselves, winning over these bad habits that we all have. So there's the fight with ourselves with our limits, with our shortcomings. And there we have to be brave. And not just say, no, I don't succeed. I am unable. I am weak. I feel bad. Weeping on ourselves. That's not to be brave. That's to be kind of cowards. A brave person faces life and wins the battle. And we have to take up responsibilities. And face our responsibilities, honor our responsibilities. That's what makes us real human beings, good human beings. A good example. We have to leave a mark on the sense of time that is a good mark, that is encouraging for uh, the next generations. We have been drawing uh, inspiration from uh, good people who lived before us, through the books, through stories that we hear about their life, what they did, any special human being 
it's a blessing for uh, the next generations. So we should also try to be a blessing for the generations to come. There was a good human being there who never harmed anybody, who tried to do his best to help anybody that came his way, the way he could or she could. Never harmed anybody. Kind words, compassionate actions. That's what makes us better human beings. Because the world is full of people who don't care about anybody, they just live for themselves. But somebody who becomes a broad human being is somebody who lives for others more than for himself or herself. It's very easy to, to be egoistic and live for oneself. That's a natural tendency with most of human beings. But the seeker of truth has to break these limits, these habits, and try to embrace, welcome, give. Doresson then says, people say that love is easy, but it's a tack, it's a uh, death of a tiger. It is the poisoned black cobra, the soul trembles and becomes perplexed. I feel your love in my bones. When I take a step, my heart throbs. From within the string of love vibrates, the soul dives into the love. Your face is like the moon and our condition is like the moon bird. The trap of love is very strong, our soul weeps. Listen us at Guru Ji Kirupal, what is our condition, the suffering ones. Forgive us, O Sadguru, gracious to the poor ones, the soul makes his request. He who wants to own the love should first sacrifice his head. Ajayip says, then he gets the darshan of the beloved. So says the Bani. He wants to end the love is to first sacrifice his head. That means dying. But not physically dying. It's a metaphoric expression. Our head, it's our mind. We have to give our mind as an offering. And we can give our mind as an offering only if you are in control of our mind. Otherwise, what do you give as an offering? Sanjay often used to mention uh, an, an anecdote of uh, Baba Savan Singh giving satsang and saying, mm, I want somebody to give me his mind as a present. Who of you is capable of giving to me his mind? And a person stood up and said, said Guru, I give you my mind. And he said, are you in control of your mind? So he said, oh no, master, <laughs> no. I will give it to you, but I'm not in control. So he said, how can you give something which is not in your control? So if you want to give something, first we have to own that something. We have to be in control of that something. And you don't get to control your mind unless you do a very intense spiritual practice. That's the only way. Otherwise, the mind is a wild horse, running wild. It's only with discipline, with daily practice, with patient daily practice, 
and by exposing ourselves from time to time to situations like this that we succeed to gain a certain control over our thoughts our mind there is no other way really there is no other way Master Kripal often when they wrote him le letters telling about their problems difficulties with life with practice he would say keep going on until we met next we meet next you will say uh, until you meet the master next and then you will see all these problems of yours will be there in you. so that's when uh, you make a jump and we spend time with the master we do sincerely and love and devotion our spiritual practice through darshan through all the practice we do all these good beautiful bhajans we sing and this beautiful divine presence that comes into play be happy we are doing the right things we are going to be together for a week and we we'll try our best to get as much juice as we can out of this week keep up your spirit be happy be joyful Be present, attentive, that we will get the best we can out of this time we spend together. And at the end of this week, we will feel really blissful, divinely happy. Master Paul often used to say, take advantage of the sun as far as the sun is in this world. Once it will be gone, then it will be over. So let's take advantage of the situation we have which is no small thing don't don't understand it is not important or uh, of little importance because it has a very great value and it's very special there is no better luck in this world than tuning in with the divinity, divine presence manifested in a human form. For me it has been like this. I hope it's the same for you. That's what makes life really special.
would like to mention something. There is a person who is suffering very much. She's a Tsangi. She's a friend of mine. <coughs> she is an initiate of Sanji from Rome. And uh, she's suffering from an autoimmune disease, just the same disease that my wife had. And she's nearing her end, really. Francesco is not here because he's helping her in this, uh, this last period of her life. So I would like that we pray to the Master for her. Not for her to get better, but for her to get out of this world. Some people are chosen to be the means of uh, paying off karma of others. They don't really, they, they haven't really done anything in their life because of which they have to suffer so much. I've seen a number of people like this. And uh, I am convinced, I know, that such people carry the burden of others also. And this person is such a case. <laughs> She's really suffering like you can't imagine. Being put on a cross is just nothing in comparison. So I pray to the Master that they take her off from this body and from this world as, as soon as possible. And she's ready to go. Every day te she asks me, did the master tell, him, tell you that he's going to come? And I say, not yet. <laughs> 